All right, let's see how this goes. So this seems to be recording. So here we are with John Bartholomew, the very popular YouTuber, 75,000 subscribers. Congratulations on that. Thank are you, Eric. Are, are, you making a, are you making a strong push for 100,000 or it's not such a big deal? Or how, what do you, what's your interpretation <laughs> of that? Yeah, I haven't been keeping track of the numbers so much in the past year, I'd say. Um, and my output has definitely gone down on YouTube. I'm not releasing videos as often. I've been streaming on Twitch a fair amount. I do still like YouTube as a, a medium. I think for me, it's the best medium for teaching yeah. a wide audience that is. But yeah, I'm not, I'm not dogging about trying to reach 100,000 subscribers or some sort of benchmark. I think just let it happen when it happens. <laughs> yeah, exactly. Well, I, I had a friend reach 100,000 and he, I, I thought he just wanted it to get that little plaque from YouTube. But then he's like, now we're making a strong push for 200,000. And I was like, <laughs> right. really? Are, are, are you going to do this at every 100,000 milestone? So, uh, you know, some people are really, uh, really enthusiastic about that. But, yeah, um, that comes with uh, the pressure to post more and keep the momentum going. Yeah. Yeah. I personally don't, uh, don't really enjoy that, that sort of pressure. Yeah. Oh, yeah. No, I, I think I, I, my guess is part of what you have enjoyed about being able to, to do YouTube and Chessable is that you can do your own thing, kind of. You can present what you want. You can, you know, promote books you like. You can, you can do the things that you like, which is really great because you're not kind of doing anything that you don't really want to do. So yes, that's, that's a great totally. Idea. And I'm grateful to be working in chess for that reason. I feel it gives you a lot of latitude to do exactly what you want to do. I mean, if you want to teach young kids or teach in schools or teach exclusively experienced tournament players or not teach at all and do writing, like you can do that in chess. Yeah, exactly. And, and what was it like when you were starting out in chess? What was your biggest motivation? Would you say, I mean, I'll just say one thing quickly. For me, it was kind of like, well, I was just playing for fun. And then it's like you get to a certain rating and you're like, wait a minute, maybe I could reach 2000. And then you're like, oh, wait, maybe I could reach 2200. Oh, well, I'm getting closer. So let's just keep going. That was how it was mm -hmm. for me. What was it like? Yeah, I'd say for me, the initial motivation was just being fascinated by the game, as I think it is for many people. Uh, it was a game that I knew had a lot of depth just right from the get go. As soon as my friend taught me it taught me the game when I was in second grade at this before school program. And it presented this first challenge of trying to beat him. Mm. Like that was the first yeah. uh, kind of roadblock to overcome. Yep. And that took me like a few months to do yep. of sustained practice. And, and I really liked the, the struggle involved in getting a little bit better. Oh yeah. And ever since then, it's just largely been the, the intellectual stimulation of it. The fact that there's always something new to learn. Yep. If you want to challenge yourself at that next level in chess, you can. And I really appreciate that about the game, uh, along with the fact that your window for enjoying the game and being able to appreciate it and even get better if you want is, is very long. Oh, yeah. I think that's one major thing that we have to be grateful for in chess. It's not like a sport where your window to reach your max potential is maybe just a few years. Mm -hmm. It's truly a lifelong activity. Yeah, I think a lot of players peak older than we are now, and uh, I mean most most players actually. So yeah, it's really it, it's really interesting. And I have a student who's seventy seven years old, and when he was seventy three, he was thirteen hundred, and now he's yeah. sixteen fifty seventeen hundred. And oh, one, awesome. one, and you know he's just he's retired. He's just a, a diehard chess lover. And so one thing he he said was he said, well, you know, you're putting out these books. Why don't we just go through the whole book in lessons? And so I, you know, I went through the whole book and just kind of made sure that, that everything was possible to understand at a 1600 level. So I was lucky to have that, that resource to be able to kind of run things by. But yeah, it's, it's really amazing. It's, it's, it's really amazing. And I think, I think a lot of people need to be careful to not tell themselves that they can't do this or that. I, I was playing in, in the Balkans and there was a guy, he was about, he was about maybe 55 years old. And he was making a strong push for IM. And he was, he, so basically, he had been 2100 most of his career. And he retired. He retired in, in his mid-50s. And I think he was a lawyer or something. And basically, he had a lot more time on his hands. And he devoted seven hours a day to studying chess. And mm -hmm. I, unfortunately, had the bad luck of playing him in the tournament as a, mm -hmm. as a rapid riser. And um, a rapid riser at 55. But, you know, that's, that, that's possible. It's perfectly possible, I think, that... People just don't see that many cases of people like that, so they think it's not possible. But it, it definitely is. I mean, a lot of it is just 
the way I look at it is that it's like you just keep learning, you keep moving in the right direction, you just keep going up. And so when I yeah. when I see guys like that, I go, wow, you know, that's that's true dedication. But I, I would see myself doing the same thing if I was in his shoes. You know, if I was retired in fifty five and I had had time to play chess, yeah, I would go around play tournaments and and kind of you know see if I could push my way up. So I think he went from twenty one forty to twenty three seventy or something. But yeah, I mean. Um, it was it was interesting to watch, you know, principled openings, deeply analyzing his game. It was, it was really interesting for me to follow. And yeah, so he had a nice base of uh, chess experience prior to making that push. Like he had been a strong two thousand player, let's yeah. say, for a couple decades at least. Yeah, you know, I, I've seen a lot of players who are around that point, and and when I show them, let's say, typical kinds of tactics or strategic themes, I'll say, "Have you seen this type of idea before?" And they go, "Yeah, yeah, I've seen that before." And so they've they've encountered a lot of things, but a lot of it is just kind of putting it together putting it into practice, you know, maybe mm-hmm. analyzing their games a little bit more deeply, a little bit more self-analysis and, and things like that. Anyway, switching gears a little bit, um, well, I guess we did talk a little bit about what you love the most about chess. One thing like that I found really, really enjoyable about chess is how there you, you get to overcome obstacles that seem almost impossible, but you can, they're kind of at the limit of that. And, mm. and so you just kind of keep going and keep going, and, and I think that's a, a really amazing thing about the game. And when you were when you were starting out, was it like, let's say when you were twelve hundred or fourteen hundred, what were you mostly working on? Were you doing mostly tactics or? Yeah, I think I was mostly playing, playing mm. online quite a bit. So uh, I used to play on the internet chess club all the time. Yeah. I'd be on there for hours a day playing Blitz and Bullet. I wish I could say I was playing exclusively longer games yeah. as I now advocate on my YouTube channel for yeah. people who are looking to improve. But yeah, uh, yeah I, I think I largely improved by playing a lot. Yeah, And I did dive into books. And actually, a lot of the books that I have on my bookshelf right now, I purchased when I was a kid, or rather, my parents purchased them for me. Mm-hmm. Uh, so I definitely would take them on like long car rides oh, and yeah. study books at home. But I attribute the vast majority of my improvement to just getting in thousands and thousands of games at a young age. I don't particularly remember doing a lot of tactics work. I mm. think that naturally came up in my games. Yes. And I'm, I'm sure I worked through some tactics books, but that was before, you know, chess modules uh, right. for tactics training were available online, really. Right, right, right. There might have been some really early ones, but I don't specifically remember doing that as much. But I, I do think if you... Um, have discipline about playing and you especially analyze those games after after the fact, which I, I did even with some of my Blitz games when I was younger, uh, that can lead to quite a bit of an imp- of improvement at that rating level. Yeah, and I would say one thing that I one thing that happened with me was I, I would go through certain books like Smyslov's Best Games or Oyve's Best Games, and there would be these huge tactical explosions right in the middle game. And so it's like rather than necessarily learning one specific tactic by studying a bunch of those games, I saw the whole sequence of how the tactic developed, how the kind of struggle basically started out in the middle of the board, and and just basically how it how it ended up, what the mistakes were, and it's interesting to just follow that whole development. And and so mm-hmm. so I don't think, in some sense, I missed out on a lot of. Th- I think I, I was mostly just trying to trying to develop a feel for the flow of the game and understanding mm-hmm. the decisions that were made. So. I made it a goal to, to mostly try to understand what type of decisions were they making. And two of the books that I loved on that were, did you ever see those Kiri's books, um, The Quest for Perfection and The Road to the Top? You know, I've never, I've never read either of those, although they've been in, I think, my Amazon uh, wish list for a while. <laughs> yeah, I, I just, I was lucky that I caught both of them. Uh, uh-huh. I caught them, I, I think I was at a, I think I got one of them at a book, used bookstore and it was 10 bucks. And then you go on Amazon, and it's ninety nine. You're like, ha ha, right. I got it. So, yeah, that was really that was really lucky. But those those were those were really good books, and and I, I love the fact that that they were kind of you know tweaked and edited a little bit. It was edited by John Nunn, I think. So mm-hmm. those those were really really high quality books. If you get a, if you if you get a chance to find them somewhere, they're they're quite nice. One thing I also like is that they have these these little diagrams, and under the diagram. In some cases, there would be just a full paragraph, a nice, you know, meaty piece of text, and you just get to sit there and go, ah, now I get to sit back, take it in, and and see what 
Kiri says about this position and while he was one of the top players in the world at, at the time. so And he really, I, I loved the direct execution of clear ideas. He would be like, mm-hmm. now I wanted to do this and nothing would stop me, so I went for this. And obviously it doesn't always work against the best players, but against the, the players like outside of the top five, many of those games were really crushing. So you, right. you, get, you, get, you get a nice exposure to a really direct punishing style. Whereas, you know, you get it with, with something I felt like, so with something like maybe Capablanca, you get more of a, a, of a nice kind of more gradual um, execution of, or, or um, liquidation, like into end games and, you know, nice, very, very good technique and things like that. So anyway, um, who do you think had the biggest impact on you as a player? Yeah, as you were discussing Paul Carey, so I was just, it brought to mind um, Mikhail Tall's autobiography, mm. which is probably my overall favorite chess book, even oh. though I didn't read it as a kid. Ah. Uh, it, it, it's just such a refreshing take uh, on how a strong player approaches the game and just oh, yeah. their unfiltered comments and thoughts mm. and total pure honesty. Yeah. Uh, so even though I don't play chess anything like Mikhail Tall, I really, yeah. really appreciate that. Mm. Uh, I would say for me, Karpov and Kramnik were the two mm. biggest influences, mm. especially as I hit a slightly higher rating. So I'd say around 1800 to 2000, I started looking into their games. Uh, so like Kramnik, My Life in Games, yeah. uh, which I guess is not quite an autobiography. It was a biography, but the annotations were largely his. Yeah, That was inspiring just to see his brand of chess. Yeah. Um, and and I, in I, fact, I, like the first major world championship match I followed was Kramnik Kasparov. Right. Um, the, the legendary Berlin Berlin Wall Championship match. Yeah. So Kramnik and hearing about his rise to the top and uh, what got him there, uh, he's always had a you know special place in my chess art. Let's say so. It's sad to see him retire now. Oh yeah, no, it's I I really thought he was uh, he brought an amazing amazing approach to the game and and some of the games that were that were in Kramnik's best games, even just flipping through some of the diagrams in there. Um, yeah, that was that was the book that actually got me back into chess. So mm-hmm. when I when I was in college, I hadn't played chess for two years, hadn't even looked at a chess board, didn't play an ICC, didn't do anything, and and when I wanted to come back to chess, I I had my Kramnik's best game on my desk. Kram, Kramnik's best games was on my desk, and I studied mm-hmm. it from cover to cover two times. And it's like, oh wow, he plays the Sveshnikov. He has a lot of fun. I want to have fun. I want to play this. So it's like, oh, he's playing this Knight A6 Kings Indian. Okay, let's, <laughs> let's do it. And it's like, oh, he's he's like sacrificing a piece against Topalov for past pawns. All right, I want to do that too. Right. And, and, yep. and, and so it's like you see these games, and you're like, okay, I'm just gonna try to emulate him. And when I I think when I started out, I had sort of the same approach. I had the book Understanding Chess Move by Move by John Nunn, and he had some of these classic games in there. And I literally tried to copy those exact ideas. And yep. there, there was this game. Did you ever see? Do you remember the game Nun Ward? Where it's this, it's the Sicilian dragon, and Nun has his bishop on h6, and he he, he throws it down to f8, and it's this oh, kind yes. of clear and sacrifice. And and in one of my first tournament games, what are the odds I get to play that exact motive? I got to play <laughs> bishop h6 to f8, and I had another game, had a game uh, against an international master about four years ago, where so so what what's so classic about this is we followed. Um, we followed Fisher Benko for the first 16 moves, and then I got to repeat the Nun Ward Bishop H6 to F8. So mm-hmm. it's like you, you feel these these classic games and ideas just showing up right there in your own games. And yeah, mm-hmm. the inspiration alone. I mean, I I started playing one night F3 specifically because of Kramnik. Oh yeah, no, I remember yeah. we we played a bunch of games where I had no answer to your Kramnik repertoire. I just lost every time. Because, you know, there was that, uh, that was one of the first opening books, Opening for White, according to Kramnik. Which, yeah, the Kaufman but, books. Th- that was one of the first books that really presented a high-level repertoire. And, and by and the, the other Kaufman ones, the Opening for White, according to Anand, I knew some IMs who just played from that exclusively. And, of course, yeah. with, with, with stronger, you know, computer development and theory developing, you, uh, obviously you couldn't use those to the same effect today. But at the time, you know, if you're just some random, you know, 2200, 2300 trying to encounter those lines put out by a world champion, um, that's not easy just as, a, as, yep. an, as an amateur player. So, um, Yeah, completely. And, yeah, going through Kramnik's games and that set of books, 
Uh, I, I think I was around 2300. I was probably FM strength when I made the switch from E4 to Knight F3. But uh-huh. I wanted to play exactly like Kremnik, like just like you were describing. I wanted to emulate these guys, and uh, I saw them beating beating the best in the world and uh, sticking to a, an approach and overall philosophy that really resonated with me. Yeah, exactly. And I think one of the great things that a lot of people might take for granted is you kind of see how all the how they play every position type. You see how yeah. the pawn structures kind of unfold. And sometimes there are really deep ideas that have really deep concepts behind them. And we can take them for granted. But a lot of the time, a lot of the time, those theoretical moves that we learn are really deep moves and have really mm-hmm. good positional principles behind them. Like there's a there's a variation in the Alakine defense where white has his knight on e5 and black has a knight on d7 challenging it. And black's knight on d7 is passive and white's knight on e5 is much more active. And white just pulls the knight back to, to mm. f3 and it's and it's kind of a perfect lesson mini lesson on exchanges on mm. when the opponent has has a passive piece and a bunch of cramped pieces on the queen side it's nice if we can just kind of keep them there and keep them tied up and just kind of keep our little space advantage and right. consolidate a little bit and and it's just a, it's just like on move eight in a couple of different alakine defense lines with knight f3 on, on move four and, you know, those things are very easy to take for granted, but I think are, are really valuable. And kind of along those lines, is, is there like a specific, really memorable, let's say, maneuver or tactic or something that you faced or that just you saw and you said, wow, that, that blows me away? Yeah. Uh, so, Eric, if, for those listening, had sent me a few of these questions in advance. So I had to go look up some games and fragments to refresh my memory. Uh, but interestingly, so this book here which I'm sure you've checked out, Recognizing uh, Opponents' Resources uh-huh. by Duretsky. Yeah. Um, I looked at this when it came out, and there were a lot of really cool examples. And there was one towards the beginning of the book that uh, really blew me, blew me away. It's this game Short versus Miles from the British Championship 1984. Uh, and it's really hard to explain this without showing you and the listeners uh, the exact position. Uh-huh. But basically, it's a sequence that lay entirely under the surface. It didn't happen in the games, uh-huh. uh, in the game itself, but... <clears throat> Uh, Duretsky explains that short playing white played a certain move, a three, kind of a temporizing move, just around his castle uh, uh-huh. on the inside king, just to kind of defend and get rid of some back right threats. But in fact, he had an opportunity to win the exchange, and he didn't go for it because uh-huh. he saw this seemingly spectacular reply by Miles, uh-huh. and presumably Miles too saw this spectacular reply. But in reply to that spectacular reply, there's a spectacular queen sacrifice, <laughs> playing the move queen to f8 check in uh, a board full of pieces in the middle game, uh, right next to black's king, and that makes the entire sequence work for white. Yeah, And I, I love sequences like that, especially featuring an unexpected move at, right at the end of a variation. Yeah. And to me, it doesn't even make a difference that it didn't happen in the game. I think it's actually more interesting that it didn't happen in the game. No, it's, it's amazing that both players recognize that. That shows tremendous depth. Yeah, yes. no, I, I love those cases. And, and personally, I've had a lot of trouble. There was this game, uh, Karpov Gick. It's one of the first games in Karpov's best games, at least in the edition Ohms version, which was one of my favorite best games collections. And, and it's, this, it's, this, it's this X-ray move that Karpov plays, and it's honestly just a two-mover, but it is one of the hardest two-movers to spot because there's just something geometrically about it that's really hard for people to, to see. It's a really mm-hmm. unusual motive. A re- almost everything about it is very unusual, and people are looking for something maybe more direct, but it's, it's just an unusual pin and x-ray and a whole bunch of things. And, and ones like that, because of how unusual it is, I remember it, I mean, so well. So those types of things just had really, really shock me, and I go, wow, okay, that's, that is something that... Um, you know, Karpov deserves a lot of credit for his tactical play, yeah. too. Every aspect, I mean, a lot of people don't really maybe respect how good um, Tall and Karpov and all these other players were at, at all phases of the game. I agree. And I think now in the age of databases and the ability to play through hundreds or even thousands of games in a short period of time, we get, we, there's a certain uh, complacency that comes with just mm. clicking the, the next arrow in chess base. Like, okay, like I've seen this sort of thing. And you're, a lot of players, strong players do this, of course. You're just yeah. arrowing through a game really fast. You're like, okay, normal, normal, normal. Yeah. But when you see something truly unusual Whoa. like that, it's a great reminder of the depth of chess. Oh, yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. And w- would you say anything kind of strikes you as a, a misconception in chess, like maybe that you read in a book a long time ago 
or conventional wisdom, let's say, that you don't teach? I, I can give you an example if you'd like me to, sure. to start. So one example is uh, a lot of the time people are taught don't advance pawns in front of your king. And mm -hmm. part of the problem is, well, we need luft for our king in many games. We need to go h3 or h6, and there are many fianchettoed positions where we go g3 or bishop g2, and you know there are positions where... So, so one thing, so I, I don't even really bother, let's say, teaching that simply because I, I, I feel like it'll cause people to, to use it against me and say, oh, no, no, I didn't want to play the winning move because I, I thought it was weakening. And, and so, you know, I, I try to get into, like, for example, in King's Indian positions where you might play f5 and then it, after e takes f5, g takes f5. And people mm. would, f so I remember I first read that in a Silman book where you seemingly open up the g file and I didn't really appreciate why that is, why that is, is safe. And part of it is that you have a bunch of pieces blocking your king physically. You have a fianchettoed bishop that helps block your king and you have four or five pieces over there. So you're fundamentally not in any danger while white has you know, no pieces attacking you. So yeah. th that's an example of something that I think can confuse people more than help. And I try not to get into kind of too much chess stereotyping. So, I w so it it's a difficult one because it'll come up a lot. Mm -hmm. Yeah, one thing that comes to mind for me, and coincidentally I was talking with a student about this just today, is um, that often in order to capitalize on a development lead, you need to open the position with your pawns. Mm -hmm. And that's something I haven't really seen explicitly expressed in too uh, many books or resources. I agree. But as a teacher, you see a lot of games, especially with your amateur students, where they're playing good, solid, logically founded developing moves in the opening. You know, let's say the game goes e4, e5, knight f3, d6, bishop c4, yeah. and then black plays h6. You know, so first three moves, black has played three pawn moves, white has played two developing moves. Yeah. And a lot of students playing white there, they may be confused when they continue playing these logical developing moves and they don't get an advantage. Yeah. And they feel like they should have gotten even greater advantage. Mm. And it took me a while as a teacher to realize they don't understand that they have to open the position, probably using their pawns, yeah. to truly create open files and diagonals to capitalize on that development advantage. So you start talking about the importance of playing d4 there and yeah. opening the position, as opposed to just by rook playing knight c3, d3, castles, and then say, hey, where's my advantage? The, the, the first time I remember seeing that in a book was in Axel Smith's book, uh, to, you know, Pump Up Your Rating, where he has the first chapter is, is no lever, no plan. Mm, and, yes. You know, and, and the thing is, he, he didn't go so so deep into it, but just introducing the concept, I thought to myself, you know, in these close positions, I do play a lot of active moves, and I do seek pawn breaks, but I just don't think about it that consciously. And and yep. so what I what I the way I described it, just I have this, the new book uh, Chess Logic in Practice, and there's a little chapter on maneuvering in close positions, and to try to help people out in in those positions in which you have to open open up the position. With, with a pawn break, I, I basically uh, mentioned three different questions that I asked myself. And the first one is, what are all the pawn breaks? The second one is, which pawn break would I like to play? And then the last question is, should I play it right away or should I prepare it? And a lot of the time, just by kind of walking myself through that, I'll realize, oh yeah, uh, I can play it right away. And, and if, you're, if your desired move can be played right away, and you realize it's tactically sound, then it's very often a really good move. And it's yeah. the same thing, just like you said, that there will be a lot of these positions where, where it'll be, you'll have a big lead in development, and a lot of the time, if, you're, if your opponent is one move away from equalizing, that by definition is the critical moment of the opening. Essentially, yes. if, you're, if you are going to obtain an opening advantage, it's gonna be on this move. You have one move right now to do it. And that's one thing that I mentioned in, in uh, applying logic in chess in the critical moments section because I thought that was really important and I hadn't heard anybody explicitly say that either. But yeah. it would have helped me to think about that and go, oh yeah, this guy, well, you know, what's the, what's the opponent threatening? Well, he's about to castle and play bishop e7 or whatever and, and get all his pieces out and then I don't have anything. So I need to look for any possible move that might give me an advantage or, or play for a serious edge. And just like you said, that will off that in many cases in closed positions, that might be a pawn break, that might even be a move that sacrifices a pawn or prepares to sacrifice two pawns. So yeah, creating threats that lead to other threats, playing with the initiative is uh, something I love seeing discussed in books. Mm. One of my favorite books in recent years is the Mastering Chess 
uh, series by Johan Helston. Oh. And three books opening, and then there's Mastering Chess Strategy, which is kind of a middle game book, and then Mastering Endgame Strategy. Mm. And I believe it's in the Mastering Opening Strategy book that Helston gives a lot of examples exactly like how you're describing, where there's a small window of time to exploit this advantage. Yeah. And if you don't create a threat that leads to other threats, the opponent is going to castle or somehow secure their position and equalize. And I just love seeing those examples because, again, it's not a topic I've seen discussed in too many books. Yeah, and a lot uh, of the time... Aside were, from the really obvious stuff. A lot of the time there will be cases where the opponent has a bunch of pieces scattered on the queen side, for instance, you're attacking them on the king side, and if you give them one or two moves, those pieces might come right over. You know, they might have a queen on AA, give them one move, they go queen A6, queen G6, suddenly the queen's there and the attack doesn't work. And the first book I, I remember seeing that in was Secrets of the Grandmaster Chess by John Nunn. And he mentioned three or four different cases of, of entire attacks that were refuted by a queen making a very long maneuver all the way around the board. And I thought it was really interesting when he said that, so I decided to make a chapter in the new book, The Defensive Power of the Queen, kind of as a tribute to Nunn and a tribute to this thing. Just because I thought, you know, that's really valuable, and I'd like, I'd like that to be something thought about a bit more. So I showed a game where I had a queen on, on d8, it went to b6, to d4, to g4, to h4, and it guarded my king, and covered all the squares, and I was up a piece, and I won. And my opponent was like, oh, this guy's about to get crushed. He has no defenders around his king. This is going to be over. They're sitting at the board, like, you know, with their arms crossed, like, that's going to be over soon. And they just, they just missed the idea, the whole idea of my queen making a huge journey around the board. So that's one, probably one of my most memorable games that I had where my, nice. my queen just traversed the whole board. So one last question I want to ask you is, what, what do you feel are your areas to improve in, in chess, and how would you go about doing it? Yeah, I think for me, and uh, I mentioned this in my tournament vlogs before, I was playing active about a year ago, playing a number of GM arm tournaments, trying to make a push to the Grandmaster title. But uh, calculation and the depth of my opening preparation uh, are two major things I need to work on, yeah. which honestly is probably going to be the standard answer for someone at my age and rating. I'm 32. I've been hanging around 2450 for many, many years now. I, I made IM uh, when I was... Um, how old was I? I think 19. So right, yeah, right. over 10, well over 10 years now. Yeah. But I know I need to work on those two aspects in greater detail if I ever truly want to make it. Um, Cause you know, when you're not working on your calculation regularly at chess, it's, it's the first thing to go. In, yeah, in my that's opinion. true. That's true. Um, also, and you get behind on your openings. You're not studying lines as actively as you should. So those are the two areas that I personally feel I need to make a lot of strides in. Yeah, I think you're exactly right about that. I think one thing is, when I one of the main things that happened to me when I, I had a really good summer in 2011, I, I booked six tournaments in a row, and it was this crazy summer. I just went tournament, 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 tournament. And the, one of the main things that I did is just like you said, my calculation was pretty much on point just from getting so much practice and analyzing the games and reflecting on what I calculated. But Another thing was, the big thing that you mentioned here is, is the depth of the opening preparation because I basically, so I was playing the E3 NIMSO with White and I, I had worked out some really nice ideas and I got to play them against a bunch of GMs and I just kind of got positions that I had really deeply studied. They were fresh in my mind and so I think I had something like six draws against GMs in the E3 NIMSO and, and almost, you know, so love, people love to play the NIMSO, I love to play the NIMSO too. But mm -hmm. um, so they, they let me play into positions I had deeply studied, and, and I had some new ideas, and I had some small novelties here or there. Not nothing too special, but I had some ways to get a small plus in some lines, and and that was like a big opportunity for me. So yeah, I, de I definitely think that's a, that's an underestimated thing around you know above twenty two hundred level, especially where it's like if if you have kind of a shallow repertoire or you don't remember a bunch of different lines. You maybe had a book on move eight or nine or ten, where you kind of yes. have to know what you're going to do. And, and even as an IM, one thing I've noticed when playing seasoned grandmasters, and especially grandmasters that are playing quite actively, is right. often my preparation will basically end or be close to wrapping up right when theirs begins. Right. And that's all because of the speed of their playing and just how comfortable even their body language is when yeah. they're resulting usually early middle game that's coming up. and. I'm thinking, oh man, yeah, I, you, you could I, really, I need to work this out in greater depth. You, you could, could really teach a body language course with their body language. language. Like, this yeah. is a confident person. If you, you look at how they play the opening here, this is the most confident person on the planet. Yeah, I, I, I saw that with Fidel Jimenez Corrales. He would have like 25 moves of prep in some line, 
And the way that he sat at the board, it was almost like watching Arts, the way he sat there like a statue. I'm like, wow, this guy, this guy knows the position. He is not bluffing anybody here. He knows this. So anyway, uh, I thought this was a great discussion. I'm really glad we got to talk. I hope we get to talk again. But Definitely. Let's do it again soon. <laughs> All right. Thanks a lot for your time. And thanks, I'll, I'll talk to you again in hopefully a few weeks. Sounds, Sounds great. great. Perfect. Right. Thank, Thank you. you.